good afternoon. Good afternoon. Are we, we're all ready to take off with some interesting information about RBTI. <clears throat> I, uh, I hope that most of you had a chance to sit in on my lecture on Thursday because uh, you'll see a lot of interesting relationships here because the first place we want to start is right side up, okay? The book that I'm holding here, if you haven't seen it, it's called Nourishment Homegrown. This is the garden book that I have available. And as you'll see right here in the, uh, says see page 122, if you have this book, there's promptings through this that show the pages that these information is on. So this book follows what I'm going to be talking about uh, this afternoon. Okay, the way I share the slides is if you want to take my home gardening course online, I have that available. I have the human concepts for an online video training system all set up if you want to learn how to become a tester and follow the RBTI concepts of human health. I also have a home garden online video training course if you want to take that. That's where you'll see a lot of this information. Now, I don't have a, an official agricultural course like I do the human course. I will have one day, but there's a lot of videos that would have to be in it. For example, showing all the details of how to run your own soil tests at home based upon the Morgan extract technique. So yeah, there's a lot of information in these but they're not wholesalely available for everybody. I'm using them as part of my livelihood to perpetuate the principles of RBTI. The basic uh, procedures for treating your garden soil, this is getting down to the nitty gritty of whys and wherefores for your backyard garden. And fortunately, it's kind of late to be doing this. This should be done in the fall of the year if you don't have the gr ground frozen down, you can do this even now, but depending on where you're living, if you were living in the uh, West Coast, it'd be no problem of doing this procedure of treatment with the various soil amendments and why and wherefore is related to it. So the soil cultivation, which we talked about on Wednesday, referred to a couple of times, this is what has to be done and it's, you have to flip that soil. In a garden situation, you're going to actually just use a spade to flip it. And the subject was brought up last, uh, on Thursday when we were talking. Is there another way of not flipping it? Can you layer it down? And the way this one individual described it, yes, you can dig out over here and take the top off of here and put it in this hole and use that repeating. What you're wanting to do is you're wanting your nutrients that are on the surface, you want them to be tipped down because what one of the ingredients you're going to put on now to begin with is soft rock phosphate. And the colloidal, the colloids in the soft rock phosphate work to the surface. And as they work to the surface, they pick up all the calcium that's now precipitating in the soil. This is why we have all of these hard pans underneath our agricultural soils and caliche clays is because nobody has stopped the, the precipitation of the calcium in the soil. Well, here comes soft rock phosphate. This is why it's such a critical substance in all soil building is it has the colloids that Dr. Reams discovered that are so unique. So when we put this now, after we flip this soil down the first time, as we go to apply the soft rock phosphate, it's going to be the first thing we put on because it's going to be our net in the soil to help uh, hold all the other things we're going to put on to build topsoil. So this is applied first because it moves towards the surface naturally in combination with carbon and picks up all other mineral naturally moving down in the soil. Every other mineral that you're interested in putting in or growing into your produce, every other mineral will be precipitating down in that soil. And what you do here with soft rock phosphate will prevent that process and start soil building, the so natural soil building process. The rate of application is at least 100 pounds per thousand square feet. Best where you have a good moisture control to apply 200 pounds per thousand square feet. 
It is non-toxic. It will not cause any issues. It will only benefit your garden soil. And everybody that has followed these concepts tells me that they could get some dramatic results initially uh, where you have at least a six-month growing season. Now phosphate, which is P2O5 to potassium ratio, is important to get that two to one. And the potassium ratios of phosphate are usually totally reversed in natural soils. And I've tested a lot of natural soils, and unfortunately the potassium in most cases outweighs the phosphate almost more than this. I've seen some as much as five and six to one instead of being two to one. If you're comparing phosphorus to potassium instead of phosphate, you'll see here this is P2O5. This is a two to one of phosphate to potassium. If you're only looking at the phosphorus, water soluble phosphorus or soluble phosphorus to potassium, it'd be a one to one ratio. This, I put this in there for people who want or are curious about getting a soil test done with the Morgan technique. And if you're interested in get a soil test done, you can contact Ag, International Ag Labs and they do the Morgan technique for testing and they are interested in helping gardeners if you want to have the testing done. Now, once you've done the phosphate, then the next natural step is your calciums. And again, a ton or 50 pounds, and I'm, I use uh, acres uh, reference a lot for what we're talking about because that's what's done in commercial agriculture. But I try and adapt it down to a thousand square foot garden as a minimum. <clears throat> so a ton of soft rock phosphate will hold six tons of lime, high cal lime. Now, it should be high cal lime. Don't ever use dolomite, okay? No dolomite is used. Don't ever use oyster shell calcium, and it's very common. I know we use it for our chickens to feed it to them to give them more calcium. <clears throat> but don't use oyster shell because it doesn't break down in the soil. It won't build your calcium. Now, you put the calcium right immediately right over the soft dark phosphate, <clears throat> so that the calcium will become bound to the phosphate. The phosphate becomes the carrier. There is a 14-day reaction that takes place, and therefore you do not want to plant in that mixture for 14 days. Otherwise, your seed will get killed. There's a natural sterilization process that goes on uh, during that 14-day period. How much? 50 to 100 pounds per 1,000 square feet. Okay, if you know that you have a high calcium soil already, then only use 25 pounds per thousand square feet. Now, if you have a real high calcium soil, for example, there's in Northern California in the high desert up on the northeast part of California and going over into Nevada, there's places there where they have 10,000 pounds of calcium per acre. It's very heavy. So that's type of situation, you wouldn't be adding any calcium to your soil if you happen to know that already. <clears throat> but you would be using, obviously, the soft rock phosphate. Now here are our best calcium sources, high cal lime and ground limestone rock. The finer the grind, the better. Okay, so talk to the people you're buying it from or looking for it from and find out what the grind is. But the finer the better because the faster it will react in the soil. Beet lime is a high cal lime, byproduct of beet processing, has extra phosphate from sugar processing. Now I've been asked, and I don't know for sure the exact answer, but sugar beets are one of the, the crops that have, a, have been GMO'd a lot, okay? So I don't know, I'm, t I'm tending to believe in the bacterial armies of our soil because bacteria are one of our best detoxifiers there is out there. And so when you're putting this on the soil, you're also going to be activating the bacteria more. So I'm uh, hopeful that the GMO beet lime can still be used because of what the bacteria will be doing to it in the process. Then there's gypsum, which is calcium sulfate. And the uh, calcium sulfate 
is something that you don't use very much of because of the sulfate. Now, those of you who are familiar with RBTI for human use, you'll realize that the sulfate calcium is a type of calcium that we use in the human diet in order to move the pH of the chemistry of the body down towards 6.4. We call it calcium lactate. It's a sulfate calcium class uh, calcium. And here we call it gypsum. So it's very reactive because of the sulfur molecule. Can be used as a calcium source sparingly. Do not apply more than 25 pounds per thousand square feet per season. In other words, you could drive the chemistry, the pH of your soil, down very low with using a lot of this. So you see the difference between using high cal lime here, which has no sulfur in it, versus using gypsum, gypsum, which has the sulfate in it. Yeah, calcium silicate probably would be okay if it, if it will break down. As long as the calcium can get separated from it in the breakdown process. Okay, well, there's nothing wrong with extra silicate in the soil, um, so it probably could be. Now, remember, do not use dolomite. Uh, be on alert, for there's many states that allow dolomite to be packaged and labeled as lime. Okay, so be aware of that. You've got, to, you've got to look at the labels. You've got to challenge what people are doing out there in the agriculture and, and uh, greenhouse world. Calcium application rate, 50 to 100 pounds per 1,000 square feet, 14-day reaction, okay? Um, most likely, this step it can be skipped. We apply potassium supplement if needed. And I say if needed, you really need to pay attention because most, as I said, most likely, very likely, your garden soil will be too high in potassium. And it's the phosphate that it needs to bring the two into the proper ratio. So potassium problems they a is aggravated by using excessive natural sources. So here's one of our problems that at natural and organic gardeners do is they use too much of these natural sources, wood ashes, sawdust, poorly digested compost, and other plant residues. All of them produce, put more potassium into the soil. So be aware of that when you're uh, using this sort of thing. So then we want to put on the nitrogen. Now we said nitrogen is the electrolyte in the soil. The electrolyte, that means it carries the charge in the ground. It allows electricity to move through the soil at a significant rate. So we should use natural sources and what we're looking for are the better manures, the better manures and chicken manure is considered one of the best as far as Dr. Reams was concerned. Uh, because Why? Because of how well chickens are fed to raise the eggs that uh, are on the market. So if you're, if you're going to a place that is raising organic uh, eggs, then that manure would probably be the better manure than the standard egg farm manure. But it's nevertheless, it's very high in certain substances and especially the bacterial activity. Oh, comfrey, okay, as a nitrogen source? Uh, I don't think it'd be too, too good because it doesn't supply enough level, okay? You're thinking of trying to get it out of the green cells of the comfrey leaf itself. Is that what you're suggesting? Well, it's nitrogen-fixing cover crop can be okay, but what you have to keep in mind is we're wanting to get our soil within a condition, on, and it's okay in a garden, but in a commercial farming situation, you want to bring your soil to the frequency of one crop. We do not suggest crop rotation, okay? Now, how close, how much of a problem this would be in a garden situation, I don't think it would be uh, at all because you have many frequencies you're growing together. All we suggest in a garden situation is you separate your fruit and seed producing uh, garden plants from the leafy, garden plants, where you're going to eat the leaves and the stalk of the plant, do keep those growing in one area, and the uh, fruit and seed growing plants grow those in another area. Because one, you need to have an anionic growth energy situation, 
and the other you need to have a cationic growth situation. Cations, when they dominate in the soil, they produce the seed and the fruit and the fruiting flowers. How many of you have had a tomato plants that you've grown big, beautiful tomato plants and all the flowers drop off, they don't set any fruit? Have you ever seen that? Okay, well, that's common and it's because the wrong energy is being produced in the soils to the plant. And it, what the wrong energy is, is the anionic energy, which grows beautiful leaves and beautiful stalks on plants, but no seed set, no fruit set or anything like that. So in a commercial farm situation, and you're growing 50 acres of, let's say, uh, beans, the, to rotate the crop between beans and corn, like is done in commercial agriculture, you're shooting yourself in the foot because the residue of the beans can't be converted each year to supply the corn because it's on a different frequency. So you're, you're really sh uh, shorting your ability to produce a high quality crop of either one or the other. Don't rotate crops according to RBTI, okay? But in a garden situation, having a cover crop could be valuable. I remember I, my son, when he moved into a, a new place, <clears throat> he says, Dad, he says, I want to get my garden going. He says, what do you suggest at this time of year? Because I don't have time to start the garden. It was too late. I said, he knew what to do with the phosphate and, and the lime and everything. I says, uh, get yourself some rye. Yeah, it was rye. And he seeded that in there and through the winter, he came, he called me up and he says, you have to come and see this. He had ryegrass that was four feet high in his garden. And that's where it started him. He chopped that down, and blended it in to, to get it going on mulching in the soil. But I mean, that ryegrass just grew like gangbusters. He, he couldn't believe it. And nobody could believe it to see it that high. <laughs> so anyway, uh, things like this work. So the chicken manure is the preferred. Now what about other manures? Horse manure is a dry manure. Uh, goat manure is a dry manure. If the animal produces pellets uh, in their uh, manure, then it's a dry manure. A cow manure is a wet manure. So chicken manure is probably the most ideal from the standpoint of moisture because it's neither too dry nor too wet. So it's good to use that way. So if you have a dry manure, like horse manure, you're better off to compost it than you are to um, use it directly on your garden. You, it would really be far better. That's what we recommend. Okay, so the preferred source is chicken. Uh, nutrient concentration and bacterial concentrations are stimulated. If it's fresh, no more than 200 pounds per thousand square feet because it becomes too hot for the planting. You can literally burn your young plants with too fresh of chicken manure. So if you have more than two, have more fresh chicken manure than you can handle in putting on in soil treatment directly, then compost it. And we'll, we'll try and get into that composting today. Talk about it and how to do it. <clears throat> Okay, then step five, other manures, cow and dairy, steer, they're higher in carbon, phosphate, and bacterial activity, 500 to 700 pounds per thousand square feet of cow, plus 100 pounds per thousand square feet of chicken. In other words, this is how you can use them together, and they're both uh, not dry manures, could be worked fine. 90% cow and steer, and 10% chicken and poultry is another is basically what we're talking about here. Sheep, goat, rabbit, and horse, high boron manures, dry manures, they're lower in carbon, and they react much slower because of their dryness. Manure quality and mixtures, the poorer the animal is fed, the poorer the manure. Most people don't even stop and think about this. How do you know how well the animal was fed when you're getting the manure? You don't, and that is a problem. You want to get the best manure, so you have to get the, that from the best animals fed. But how do you know that? That's, so that's a challenge. Other nit nitrogen sources could be considered. It's bat, bird guano, and fish meal as, as a good uh, 
a nitrogen source to be used. Anyway, here is the layer cake method. Rough plowed, layer number one, soft rock phosphate. Rough plowed, soft rock phosphate, high cal lime, potassium source, if need, potassium uh, source we want to uh, look seriously at not using or not or leaving out because most likely your garden situation is high in potassium already. Okay, now for orchards and vineyards, you're gonna skip the cultivation step. The reason you're gonna skip it, you don't wanna cultivate orchards, is you wanna draw the feeder roots of the trees up into the topsoil. And cultivating that topsoil just cuts them off and the tree bleeds, just like you'll bleed if you were cut. Those roots will bleed out sap and you're actually uh, uh, really causing the tree to be shocked. So don't cultivate in orchards and vineyards. Now follow the steps as we talk about. Apply all amendments right over the grass. Keep manures away from the tree and the fine trunks. Keep manure in the middle of the rows from the tree or vine drip line. In other words, look at the drip line. If you're looking at the tree's foliage outline, that drip line is right out at the edge. And so you go from there out to the middle of the row is where you're going to apply those nitrogen sources. If you use high quality compost, then you can skip steps two and four and apply the compost instead of the manure. But high quality compost is an, takes important skill to produce. And it can be produced, but unfortunately so much of the home produced compost is partly digested. It doesn't have the mineral base that it needs and it's mostly just partially decomposed plant waste. So uh, I'd like to get into that <coughs> here today before our time is up. Now making high quality compost, you will see the compost formula on page 130 in the book, the garden book. One ton of manure, equal parts poultry and steer or mushroom castings. One ton of sawdust, avoid pine, Fur sawdust is best, 100 pounds of soft rock phosphate, 200 pounds of high cal lime, 40 pounds of sugar, or better, four, ground, four gallons of feed grade molasses. You see, if you're going to make a compost, you need to put the good ingredients in it so it comes out high quality, and you've got something that the plants are going to love. So 20 pounds of fish meal, four to, uh, two to four pounds, uh, or two to four gallons of liquid fish, one pound of kelp meal or powder, 50 to 100 pounds of beet pulp, citrus pulp, or some other food processing or produce department waste. You can go to your supermarkets and they have a lot of wasted produce that uh, they'll be glad to give away and those can be used uh, in your compost pile. Check with uh, fresh grass cuttings are good to use as well. A pound of iron sulfate and a pound of copper sulfate. Other helpful ingredients, there's tobacco is an insect resistant uh, and can be used. Now you just don't use it around susceptible uh, fruit for tobacco mosaic viruses like tomatoes for example and potatoes. But otherwise tobacco can be a valuable um, source of, uh, of insect resistance in the compost itself. Now the, the compost pile says all ingredients must be well mixed together, heaped into a high pile as possible. Must have sufficient water to maintain 50% moisture. Now uh, you can take a wood dowel if you want to monitor, you need to monitor the moisture in this pile. So you're going to take about a six or eight foot wood dowel and it can be anywhere from uh, three quarters to an inch. And you're going to stick that in the pile after the pile's made. And if there's proper moisture, when you pull that out, what are you going to see? The dowel's going to be wet. If there's not enough moisture in that compost pile, when you pull that dowel out, there won't be any water on it. It'll be dry. So that's what you're going to use to measure uh, your uh, availability of moisture. You're going to want to measure the temperature, so you're going to need to get yourself a good thermometer that can be used agriculturally 
and that will then be able to be put down into the pile where you can follow the temperature. Temperature regulation is important. You don't want to overheat the compost. You want it to break down. If you overheat it, you get too much ash, and the ash is a place where you get excess potassium, and that's going to be an, an issue if you use that on your garden and you have already too much potassium. <clears throat> uh, the laboratory grade thermometers is what you're going to need, and the heat will the, the heat will go too high if not enough moisture causing the causing ashing. So, if you have heat, then it's going over 144, and then you're going to need to add more water to it. So, there's two reasons for water: if it's too dry, based upon the Dowell test, or if it's getting too warm, you're going to add extra water. You want to cover to keep heavy rain off of it, so a tarp with inch holes about a foot apart on a grid laying over it. So if you have heavy rains, some will get through, but it won't dilute the pile out while it's working. Another way to keep track of the moisture is, is what I just told you is about the dowel. And, uh, after 24 hours, pull the dowel out to inspect it. So you've got to leave it in for at least 24 hours to see if it's at least initially on it when you use it to see that it's, there's enough moisture there to uh, work the pile correctly. Now, step six is you're going to add extra iron sulfate and copper sulfate to your garden if not using high-quality compost. You notice in the compost we put the iron sulfate and the copper sulfate, and we don't do not prefer these uh, chelated iron and copper um, uh, fertilizers. They're out there on the market, but we don't like them because they're too reactive in the soil. The sulfate and the copper and iron sulfate are much slower in their reaction, and you, won't, uh, over, oh, you can almost overdose with the chelated iron, copper sulfate, or the chelated copper and chelated iron. Two pounds per thousand square feet of each, that's three to four ounces per hundred square feet if you have a smaller garden than that. That's only three to four ounces. You want to leave the layers as they are all winter long. If you're unable to apply the ingredients in the fall, apply early enough in the spring to at least allow the 14-day reaction between the soft rock phosphate and the colloid and the calcium to take place. Leave the layers undisturbed for 14 days, then till at least three times at 90 degree angles to the previous till direction. So that uh, is something we want to make sure you're working the pile, working your uh, soil uh, at different directions as far as aeration, as far as mixing, and this sort of thing. Now, basic principles, step eight, spring seed bed preparation. Try to keep soil preparation less than six inches the first spring because less energy potential. What I mean by that is that if you dilute by mixing the ingredients that you put on in the fall, you mixing it too deep, too many, too many inches at a time, it dilutes it out too much. So your seed bed doesn't have as much energy in it, it'll be too low below, it'll be down below the seed, and the seed needs more energy, and it won't get it if you first till too deep the first time through. So till it sh more shallow so that you don't dilute the uh, nutrients that you have on the top. Now planting time, highest quality seed possible. How do we do that? We look at the seed count per pound. The less, the better. If you have 11,000 seeds per pound, it's better than 1,300 seeds per pound when you're talking about small seeds. A seed according to germination rate. If less than 85% seed, or 85% germination, 25% more seed is recommended. So you'll find the poor quality seeds will have an 85% uh, germination rate and the high quality seeds will have in the 90 percent uh, germination rate 98 95 98 percent so pay attention to that's the way you can determine quality now why are we interested in high quality seed exactly it's faster germination 
And you can tell when you plant a bunch of corn seed, for example, that that comes up first is better seed than that which comes up last. So Reams will recommend that you plant 25% more seed or more and let it all let it come up and you'll see the big plants come up first, the healthier ones, and you go along and thin out, take out the little ones and get rid of them. And save your own seed. Terminator seeds are what's becoming popular in the seed industry today, unfortunately. They want to try and control what uh, the man is, has, av able, has available to grow. And making terminator seeds means that they're going to grow a seed that will is a sterile seed. It'll produce, it'll grow, but the seeds that it produces after it grows will not germinate whatsoever. So <clears throat> avoid those. Step 10, growth and production stage. You're activating proper energy, activating the right type of growth to be discussed in the next section. Okay. Now, we're not going to go into that um, because <clears throat> potassium and copper, potassium and copper uptake by the plant needs to be stimulated with sulfamag. And we're particularly talking, uh, well, we're talking about everything but particularly where you see this is you see this in trees, deciduous fruit trees, but it affects everything. Uh, be sure it, to, it is uh, the real stuff. I'm talking about sulpomag here. If you haven't heard about sulpomag, it is a natural occurring ore that when used uh, around fruit trees, it, it stimulates the copper uptake for uh, fruit trees. Now, when you have, don't have enough copper in the ground for a fruit tree, two, a couple things will happen. If it's in the stone fruit class, like peaches, apricots, cherries, this kind of thing, when there's not enough copper, you get bacterial gummosis started. If you've ever seen sap leaking out of a peach tree or a cherry tree or apricot tree, that's where the, the bark has split open too much. And a, tree, a tree's bark grows by splitting and then healing over, splitting and healing over if it's growing correctly. But without the copper, it'll split too far and will not heal over. And then you have bacteria come in and infect the leaky sap. Now, I've seen trained agricultural men who will say, oh, the cause of that's bacteria. No, I'm sorry, it's not bacteria that cause it. They're opportunists. Free room and board has been provided for them. All they're doing is going in there where they have an opportunity. But the real cause is a copper deficiency, a, phosph a phosphate of copper deficiency, because all mineral goes into a plant in phosphate form. So a phosphate deficiency of... Uh, of copper is what results when you have this deficiency. Uh, you don't use sulpomag in a high magnesium soil, okay? So in a high magnesium soil, you need your best thing to do is sell it, get rid of it. It's high in magnesium, yeah. Well, and why is that a problem? Because magnesium is the enemy of nitrogen. You're going to have a real hard time keeping the nitrogen working in your soil because when magnesium comes in contact with it, it turns it to a gas and releases out in the atmosphere. And so you can't keep enough nitrogen available going all the time. Well, this, is, this, this works, doesn't work separately. When you add sulpomag, because it has magnesium, if you're using the correct sulpomag, you can buy sulpomag that is manufactured synthetically. They combine commercial fertilizers to make a, a commercial sulfamag. But in the natural sulfamag, the langbanite ore, the magnesium doesn't separate from it. It works as a catalyst for copper uptake together. So it doesn't add to the magnesium levels in your soil is what I'm getting at. Okay. Okay, so apply five pounds per thousand square feet of langbanite whether you're going to use it around trees or you're going to use it in your garden, the time to apply it is between September 15th 
or it's July 15th, excuse me, and September 15th. That's the time to apply it in the Northern Hemisphere, just six months off in the Southern Hemisphere. So if any of you live in South America, you would use it opposite of that, six months off. But the Reams found that this was key to getting the copper uptake in plants. Another indication of copper problems is damping off fungus, okay? Have you ever had uh, uh, germinating beans and things like this? And they come up and they're just now germinating. All of a sudden, next morning, you find them totally laying flat. They've, they're wilted down. And if you look closely around the soil line, there is a mold there. Well, that's a damping off fungus that is taken over. And one of the reasons for it is a copper deficiency in the soil. And langbanite or sulpomag can help uh, counteract that. Apply between July 15th, as I said, and September 15th. Any other questions on this? Okay, after harvest, step one, working towards getting a minimum level of available calcium. This is 4,000 pounds per acre or 100 pounds per thousand square feet. And if you were going to have a soil analysis done by, say, ag labs, um, they would be able to tell you how successful you were after your first fall application and getting started with these concepts of getting your calcium up, your phosphate up, and your potassium in ratio to the phosphate. Okay, now I want to shift to some other interesting things that are in our garden book. Now there's another practical part to RBTI, and uh, that is I want you to be able to <clears throat> understand how you're choosing quality when it comes to food. Normal or dent corn. This is something that has always bothered me because it's very typical that in commercial corn growing, the grains that the corn meal is made with commercially comes from dent corn. That's its nickname, and it's considered normal to have this funny looking end on them right here. It looks like candy corn when you pull them out. And so we want you to see different ways, things to look at to consider how you're going to use these, some of these uh, principles towards helping you select corn. If you are a person who likes to grind your own grain, then this is going to be critical for you selecting the kind of corn in the health food store or wherever you're getting it for grinding. But when grains are deficient, they are chalky, they are opaque, in other words, light translucency isn't there, they're softer and they have a dull appearance, they're dusty, incomplete filling, and this is what's happened here, is this has not had enough energy to fill out before it dried down in the maturing cycle. And then you have less than maximum mineral energy potential. So one of the things that was happening here probably 10 years ago, maybe more than that, that was you saw it on the news, and this was grain elevators blowing up. Well, why did they blow up? They blew up because the grain that was going into the elevators, particularly wheat, was so poor that they were breaking down. And the dust that was coming off of them was filled with nitrogen. And nitrogen is an explosive by itself. And so when that dust full of nitrogen was ignited with a spark, we had an explosion, just as much as any dynamite that you could blow up. And that's the result of what's happened as a result of the deterioration due to mineral deficiency. In other words, there wasn't the, the full capability of this, this, these kernels was not acknowledged, not filled up. So now you have them drying down, and as they sit there dry, over the years, they, they get worse, they break apart, and it becomes dusty. Here's some more examples of what you can see. Here, this one, for example, did not have its manganese at all, so it couldn't develop a viable seed, and yet it would look like it from all practical purposes unless you took a closer look. Same thing here. 
soft, dull, du dusty, incomplete filling, less than maximum uh, mineral content. Now here is a uh, cob of popcorn. It says, even though it appears translucent and glossy and hard, note the cracks. See these cracks right here. These kernels will not pop. You, they, and that's why if you want to get better grown corn to grind, it'll challenge your mills, it's popcorn. Grind popcorn and use that for grind, ground corn or corn meal. And you'll actually have way better uh, uh, co content of food in your diet if you're gonna use grain like this. Here's another, there's, there's, uh, if you look down here at the base or down up here at the end of the cob, why are these kernels so round and these are so flat? Because these didn't fill out like they should where these filled out. So you should, your kernels should be pretty round and, and over the top. You see these are looking round but they're not flat and dented like these are and yet these are considered normal corn. No dense, more translucent, harder, glossier, larger and heavier, incomplete, filling less than maximum mineral energy potential again. So, <laughs> yeah, if it doesn't have the sugar content, the natural sugar content, that's why it doesn't taste that way. It hasn't had a chance to, to fill out in the full sugar content. Yeah. So here, we, again, we're comparing uh, these two and showing where the kernels fill out. And these would certainly taste different because they'd have a higher sugar content than those that, didn't, that were incomplete in filling out. High quality corn will weigh approximately 0.5 to 0.6 grams at 16% moisture here. So that is something to keep in mind because as you, those who attended the Thursday class, uh, we showed how to calculate the difference in energy between a poor quality grain versus a high quality grain, a corn kernel versus a low quality corn kernel. High mineral energy Indian corn. Now Indian corn has the potential of having a much higher natural uh, mineral or mineral content than the hybrid corn, dent corns that we were just showing you. And you see most of these that you're looking at across here, they don't have the dents uh, if you put light over them, you find out they're more translucent. They're harder and they're glossier. That's that glossy finish, which makes them more impervious to eating insects and uh, because of their waxy-like cuticle. They have a natural cuticle they develop, which protects them. They're not dusty. They're larger and harder. They, when they're not dusty, they don't break down. These things that almost exist forever if nobody disturbed them. Uh, they have complete filling. They have a maximum mineral energy potential. So Indian corn, if uh, we used to, when we started finding this type of thing out, we would buy the blue corn chips, for example, because blue corn had a much more potential for filling out than the hybrid corn. Okay, good question. What is maximum energy potential since she's new to this concept? What it has to do with is how much sugar does is built in to that produce by the photosynthesis process. Okay, you understand photosynthesis and how this is the source of the sugar making process that will go into the produce that you're gonna consume. The, the law is the higher the sugar in the sap of the juice of the, of the fruit, the higher the natural mineral content. So maximum mineral content would be, mean that that produce has to have the highest potential sugar built into it, that it's possible. Now, we'll touch on this in just a second. But the refractometer, do you know what a refractometer is? Okay, a refractometer is for the purpose of measuring the natural sugar content of foods like this in the, from the garden. And that, the higher the, sh the sugar content, the higher the refractometer's reading. Yeah, well, it, it works 
but you'll understand that, that if it's being bred for high sugar content, what they're doing is they're bypassing the phosphate process that is bringing in the mineral because all mineral comes in in phosphate form. Without the phosphate, you can't get the mineral in there. So what alternate process they're using, I, at this point, I don't know, you know, but there's a, nature's process is they use phosphate as a catalyst to combine water and carbon dioxide, okay? And that gives you the sugar, okay? And in, as the two come together, phosphate is a catalyst to help that process. And as the, as the day cools down in the evening after the sun's been up causing photosynthesis, in the evening as it cools down, the phosphate escapes back into the roots of the plant to, prick, to pick up more um, uh, mineral, okay? So you've got a good question there. I don't have the answer to, I don't at all, but they're bypassing if they truly are creating more sugar according to the refractometer and they're not utilizing the phosphate process, they have some other process that they're bypassing it. I don't know, do you know? Yeah, well plant sap, you'd use a refractometer to analyze that the same way, but it would change there would be, as the day cools down or as the day warms up, there will be a variation in that uh, reading. But <coughs> Reams instructed us to, if we wanted to understand some things about the phosphate to nitrogen ratios and the, and the phosphate or nitrogen to potassium ratios, that uh, you had to take the test the sap with a refractometer at the same place once every 24 hours. And if there was more than two degrees bricks difference in a 24 hour period, then you didn't have the phosphate to nitrogen ratio that you needed, it wasn't working. So that was the main thing they used for it, but you could test the quality of a plant that way too. Well, it's, it's a different, you're looking at something different. It's not directly related to the quality of the food itself. But if you are going to, let's say you're going to eat the broccoli, you can certainly squeeze the juice out of broccoli and analyze that. Uh, you know, you could chew, squeeze the juice out of, of onions, for example, and analyze that. So it's not um, directly the leaf of the plant, but the leaf of the plant won't tell you what the fruit of the plant is necessarily. So did we answer your question now? Yes. Sufficiently? Okay. All right. Now here's normal hard wheat. And if you, these were put on a light to look at their translucent, the more translucent they are, that means the harder they are. That's all I'm trying to show here is because if they're not translucent, that shows they're not, uh, they don't have the density of mineral in them. The higher the density of mineral, the more translucent these grains will be. And these were uh, uh, grains from a friend of mine that grows them. And so the better quality, the hard wheat. Now you have soft wheat, white wheat, and you have hard red wheat. The difference between the two is the mineral content, pure and simple. You'll have people that say, oh, I like white flour from soft wheat. Well, if you do, then you're getting way less mineral than hard red wheat. And then other people will get the hard red wheat to grind that in their home mills. And again, they don't know the quality unless they have inspected it, like we're talking about here. So chalky, opaque, soft, dull appearing, not dusty, incomplete filling, less than a maximum energy potential. Now, how do you know this? Well, there's two ways to measure the quality of grain like this. What you have to do is you have to grind it into a flour, if it's dry grain, grind it into a flour, and then you have to take distilled water and mix with the flour until you get a relationship that will give you juice. Otherwise, you'll have paste if you don't have enough water in it. So you mix it until you have enough to give you juice in it, but you have to keep track of that ratio. What's the ratio of flour to water when I get to the point where I've got a bit of liquid to measure on a refractometer. Then once you measure it, then you're gonna to have to multiply it out to determine what the actual sugar content was. Otherwise, if you're living near where they're growing this grain, you can go to the field 
when it's at the point of almost ready to, to start drying down to harvest, it's still green, you can take that green head, squeeze that in a garlic squeezer and get some juice out of it, and you can actually measure the quality that way before the head is dried down. Uh, here's a cross section of a kernel of wheat. We have the endosperm is the large area here in the middle, and around it is the alerone coat, and it's the, the um, protein source. And of course, this one, it's put into the ground, starts picking up moisture. And there's, through osmosis, the moisture comes through here and mobilizes all of the contents here, the protein, the carbohydrates, and everything. And that's what starts the germination process. So the higher the carbohydrate content in this seed, the denser it will be. The denser it will be, it will mean it will attract water faster, so it'll hydrolyze faster. That means this seed will germinate faster. And when the seed or plant germinates faster, you'll have a higher quality plant, and the end result will be a higher quality produce from that, uh, from that seed. All right, so more translucent because of higher mineral density, natural sheen because of higher mineral density and the natural uh, wax coatings that come on these kernels. And by the way, uh, the higher the sh sugar content in a grain or produce, the higher the natural oil content. So if you're growing oil seeds, if somebody wants to grow oil seeds, they need to pay attention to how the kind of seed they're getting, where that seed comes from, and how they're growing it. Because if they don't grow it correctly, they'll have a poor quality uh, oil from that seed when it's, after it's harvested. High quality wheat will weigh approximately 0.045 grams at 16% moisture per berry. That's one of the ways you can start calculating out uh, what it's going to take to produce how much wheat. All right, the seed principles. Uh, the germ of the seed cannot form without the element manganese. Okay, so manganese is vital. If you don't have manganese, you don't have a seed that will become viable at all. So the germ is right in here. Here is the radical. This is where the first roots come out. This is where the ver first top growth will be right there. Now when you look at these kind of things, here happens to be some sunflower seeds. And again, it's the same way. Take a look at what you can see in the difference of are the seeds hard and large? Are the seeds scaly? And the more scaly they are, it tells you of the poor quality. By the way, bananas, the small bananas have just as much energy as a large banana. That's what's unique about bananas. So if you're, if you're going to select bananas, you get just as much out of a banana this size as you do out of this one this size. Uh, the sugar test is the best test. The seed test, now here's an example of a seed test, just cutting this tomato open. Look at how many seeds are not there. It's missing. Now that's an example of, again, not having enough manganese. Uh, in this in the soil. Seedlessness, lack of manganese, genetic not allowed past the root crown. That's what happens genetically when they make seedless plants or seedless uh, produce is they affect this transfer of manganese at the root crown and that's what stops it. So uh, seedless fruit is not as healthy as seeded fruit. We don't prefer it, and yet the agricultural world is promoting uh, seedless fruit everywhere you turn today. Shriveled, as in nuts and uh, split pits in stone fruit, those kind of things are signs of mineral deficiency. Yes, that's right. It's preventing things from going through, preventing the manganese from going through up to the top part of the plant. That's right. Okay, here's uh, examples of missing seeds. Look at how few seeds there are in this tomato. So you, have, you can take uh, the juice test with a refractometer. You can cut them open. You can look what's going on inside. For ex 
Yeah. Now here's an example of the knife test, we would call it, just cutting it open. Uh, this is a potato, and this is a classic sign of boron deficiency. Boron deficiency means that they don't fill out. And you'll see this in strawberries, for example. I, it's very common when I get strawberries, exposed to strawberries for breakfast, like I've had here uh, a few times. They like to cut them open and see what the inside looks like, and most of the time they're hollow inside. And that's because of a boron deficiency. Now here, manures like horse manure and chicken manure have boron, so you're gonna have extra boron if you're doing the soil treatment like we talk about uh, that RBTI recommends. Then you have uh, a weight test. The heaviest within the group will have the highest sugar content. So that you'll see people, you know, picking up watermelon and then weighing and see which is the heaviest. That's the kind of, re that's the reason they're looking for that, is the heavier the watermelon, the higher the sugar content. <clears throat> but the problem is most watermelons now are seedless today, not seeded. And the seeds want to grow, they're there, the white seeds are there, but they don't develop because the way the genetics of the plant is designed, the manganese can't get through the root crown of the watermelon vine. <clears throat> and then the general appearance. Has it been picked too green, unable to reach maximum nutrient potential? And usually most of the time when it's picked green, it's because if it's left to ripen, it'll start rotting. In other words, it'll mature too fast. And that's related to uh, sulfur in the soil. The commercial farms are using too much ammonium sulfate. All right. Um, uh, for, from the use of sulfur-containing fertilizers, ammonium sulfate's only one of them, yeah. Uh, not always it can be, but it okay. usually isn't. It usually isn't. There's usually too much because if they they used any commercial fertilizers had sulfur in them, it might be too much. It doesn't release real quickly, no. Okay. Mm -mm. okay. But again, bacterial activity, yes. That's, v that's very cool. sulfur, high in sulfur. sulfur yeah. Oh, sulfur deficient, okay, yeah. Well, then, then you could use those kind of things. You, adding sulfur to the soil, you have to be careful of because it can be too hot. It's a very hot fertilizer, and if you uh, put too much on, then you get too much soil heat, and then you cause problems with killing your produce. Element, no, elemental sulfur is, the higher, is the higher reactionary. Okay. The sulfate is not. Okay. The sulfate is a sulfur oxygen, where sulfur itself is just sulfur and it's very very reactive. All right, uh, fertilizer practices causing problems are excess sulfate nitrogen. They uh, not, they rot instead of uh, mature properly or ripen at maturity and they ex excess nitrogen brings on excess water and low sugar. So excess nitrogen can be an issue too that uh, we need to watch for. Here's an example of a strawberry that's hollow in the center, uh, which is expressing boron deficiency. So uneven ripening, there's two things. The skin appears uh, to have a natural coat, not artificial. The healthier, the heavier. Evidence of dehydration of the citrus. So dehydration is, can be indications that there is a, enough sugar so that the nature is allowing the, allowing the fruit to dehydrate. Uh, it can be misleading sometimes as far as size is concerned. Stem presence uh, is one thing that's important to, to understand. This on a citrus, the higher the quality of the citrus, the harder this stem will stick in here. Most of the citrus we see today do not have stems stuck in them, evidence of the calyx. Of the calyx, right? The calyx is the little bud scales. The calyx is when the flower develops and comes out, there is little scales that are over the flower before it opens. And that's what those little star shapes are on there, are the bud scales. And as the bud opens, the scales fold back and the petals come out of the flower. And that's called the calyx right there on that stem. And citrus, uh, it's easy to pick out better quality citrus by looking for the, where the stems stick pretty hard. 
especially on lemons, and because Dr. Reams was so uh, vehemently uh, used lemons, and so important that lemons were so important in the human diet that uh, the, we look for the stems, the calyx end, to be stuck in them, and you'll get better and better lemons that way. Okay, uh, disease test, irregularities as evidence of poor quality, fungus evidence, why a concern. Uh, the pictures I have here of this, interestingly enough, is showing you a potassium issue. And when you have misshapen fruit, that's a potassium, can be a potassium issue. And then you, if you have a fruit or a, uh, uh, let's say a squash or something like that, the shape of that squash naturally is related to potassium. So there can be a genetic misshapen, natural misshapen uh, squash or something like that that's all because of the genetics of it. But where there isn't a genetics, then you get these kinds of twisting uh, that take place or distortion. This isn't too bad, but uh, with a lot of potassium deficiency, you'll get more twisting or misshapenness. And then, there, of course, there's the smell test. Uh, smells are energy. 150,000 cations released to cause a smell, according to Dr. Reams. So how many times do you see people smelling picking up peaches, picking up apricots or nectarines and smelling the ends. That's what we do. <laughs> You'll see my wife going in and looking at produce and she's smelling the stem end up to see if there's any odor. You also look for juice, like in a lot of times your melons. If you look for juice after the melon's been picked, it'll start leaking juice out of it. That's a good sign that you've got a pretty good melon. And uh, uh, otherwise, you don't really smell much on most commercial melons. The more energy contained in a fruit or a vegetable, the more energy that can be released during the ripening period. Now this is interesting because here you're looking at another manganese deficiency situation. Here you see the seeds of an, I believe this was a pear that I cut open, and it was literally one seed was in it. That's the one you see right here. These had not developed at all, so that's a very gross manganese deficiency. On another one, there was this is what attempted to start developing, but then they quit. This is kind of the embryo of the seed, and it just was left there. Here are cross sections of grapes, and here's a seed grape and then a seedless grape. Now what's interesting is here you see these rings, and that's a beginning of an indication that they were starting to get enough calcium. The more calcium they pick up, uh, the more you'll see these rings in the, in the cross section of the grape, telling you that it's higher in mineral content and it'll taste sweeter. <clears throat> it'll register higher on a refractometer. Here's the calyx again of the citrus. You see here, this one doesn't have it at all and this one does have it. Now, seedless fruit is manganese deficient, as we said. Hollow stems are, are equal to boron deficient. Hollow or deformed nuts equal manganese deficiency. The greater the number of seed, mature seed, produced, the better the quality. Dusty seeds, grain and hay seed, poor quality. Protein, uh, there, there is a poor protein. And that means that protein nitrogen is being released, so that's what we refer to the grain explosions. And top quality fruits will dehydrate, not rot or mold. And I had a, a couple of uh, experiences with this. One, we had got some very top quality mandarin oranges, and they dehydrated to the point they were like golf balls, hard as everything. You literally had to take a saw to cut through them. And that's really a good sign. So the higher the sugar content, the heavier the fruit. The sugar creates weight. The mineral creates weight. Now, vegetables, uh, not only is the sugar test, make sure it's fully hydrated. If not, you get a false sugar reading. So when you're doing vegetables of any type, make sure they're fully hydrated, not dehydrated. If they're wilted or uh, then they, they're not hydrated correctly. 
slime on the leaves shows fungal deterioration. You see that real rapidly in lettuce and leafy fruits if uh, the fungus sets in on them because they get slimy. The cut end of the stem, any hollowness or boron, black heart and potatoes is boron deficiency. Potato eyes are deep set. Here you see potato eyes like this. This is another sign of manganese deficiency. Those potatoes, if they're, if they're plenty of manganese, will be totally smooth over them. So don't choose those kind if you're looking for potatoes. And the absence of plant odor means absence of mineral sugars. Here's an example, a close-up of manganese deficiency. Here's another one of a boron called black heart. Now here's the gamosis I was talking about. This is a cherry tree and this splitting here and the sap running out and getting jelly-like as it solidifies is just a classic example of phosphate of copper deficiency. Here's another one where we're seeing uh, split bark and it will open up and we have some gummosis right here. We have some more on this particular tree and some more here on this particular tree. This is such a common thing and the uh, agricultural scientists will say it's caused by bacteria which bacteria are only opportunists. They're there because free room and board was provided them and uh, if the copper had been adequate we wouldn't have those problems. I wouldn't, I wouldn't know what they would be signs of at all. Um, it, the, the possibility is several things. One, it could be a fungus. Uh, two, it could be um, just a, 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 the way the tree grows because it got injured at some point in time and grew around that particular injury. And in fact, uh, are, have the same thing. Yeah, I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Now, <clears throat> here's uh, tips to food preparation. There are some interesting things that uh, you learn from Dr. Reams when you're around him working with different things. And uh, these are the things that he recommends. Use fresh lemon juice instead of vinegar. Vinegar is so common today to use, and people say, well, I use apple cider vinegar. Well, if the body is too acid already, vinegar is going to make it worse. And that's why in studying, knowing the pH of the urine, it's very vital to help understand what stresses the, you're putting the liver under if you're eating a lot of apple cider vinegar. Steaming veggies is preferred to boiling and do not blanch vegetables before freezing. And that's a classic common thing, is blanching vegetables. Bring water to a boil before adding vegetables. Fixes nutrients, ignore if making soups, of course, all right? Limit cooking in oil, loss of fat-soluble vitamins if you're cooking in oil, a lot. And the temperature can be too hot with oil, that's the other thing. Sauteing would be like the Chinese do it, okay? They put a uh, little water and a little olive oil and then they saute in that mixture. And why do they? Because the water will not get any hotter than 212. That means that it won't pass the smoke point of olive oil or the oil they're using, so it doesn't get too hot. The water keeps it controlled, you know, temperature control. <clears throat> That's right. You, you, what you're doing is you're causing the, uh, the crosslinks in the molecule to become a saturated. Okay, so you end up with, an, with a non-saturated fat being converted to a saturated fat, which is hard to digest. It happens when you overheat an oil past its smoke point. Yeah, that's why coconut oil has become such a favorite now for a lot of food preparation because it has a very high smoke point and it's already cross-linked, okay? It's already saturated. It, won't, it can't be changed by that heat. All right. Uh, cook in covered pans to cut the time of cooking. Cooking vegetables whole and 
then cut them after cooking preserves more of the vitamins. Freezing is better than canning economically and nutritionally. Preserving large quantities of vegetables, Reams's technique was this. Juice one-third of the quantity, cook the other two-thirds in the juice of the one-third, cook and prepare for table ready, freeze in serving sizes. Now, I don't know how many people have juiced the beans when they want a part of them, when they want to freeze part of them for table ready use, but that's what Reams would do. And it makes sense because now you're not diluting out the energy with adding water into that situation. Oop, back wrong way. Uh, keep freezer at least 10 degrees below zero. I don't know how you, many of you do that, but that's vital towards food preparation, our food pres preservation. Because what? You don't realize how the metabolism of the foods you have in the freezer are continuing even under quote-unquote frozen conditions. So if your freezer is only zero, then those... Uh, uh, fruit foods in your freezer are metabolizing at a higher rate than if they were 10 below zero, okay? It, metabolism is still going on after effect. Uh, let's see, in all food preparation, be aware of how to supplement the mineral sugars and calcium. Dry powdered milk is a good way to supplement calcium in calcium deficient foods when you're preparing them. Blackstrap molasses, sorghum syrup, and dehydrated cane juice are all organic and non-GMO. You can get those, and those are good ways towards augmenting the mineral energy in the foods you're preparing. Organic olive oil and organic corn oil are very valuable. However, I have, uh, in the last year, I would say two years now, I've come to appreciate more than ever hemp oil. I don't know how many of you use hemp oil in your diets, but hemp oil is very valuable oil. Uh, it's very high in nutrition, and it's very high in the right ratio of omega-6s to omega-3s. That's linoleic versus linoleic acid, the two different uh, acids, right, fatty acids. Why did I? Because yeah. Dr. Reams really liked corn oil. Why? Why? Because of its value. Uh, and it's very high in omega-6s, by the way. Uh, it's, it was a good source of nutrition. If you, can, you can get non -G organic and non-GMO corn oil. It is available. Yeah. But you don't want the, you just obviously don't want the GMO because it's one of the first plants that was highly GMO'd. <laughs> no, I understand why you would question that. But if you can get the high-quality corn oil, that's good. But we, I'm finding now <clears throat> that uh, we use primarily a little olive oil or a little bit of, uh, of uh, uh, coconut oil in our cooking, but we don't do much cooking. In other words, we fi find ourselves doing less and less cooking uh, we, as the days go by. And then we use the um, hemp oil as a dietary supplement instead of cooking with it whatsoever. And it's an excellent uh, oil because of the omega-6s and omega-3s. Or omega, yeah, omega-3s. No, not, just not cooking as much as we used to. In other words, we aren't doing, I used to bake all of our bread. We, we don't eat hardly any bread anymore. We decide we're not going to eat bread. We decided that we are going to get all of our nutrients out of basic things in our diet, and bread is not going to be one of them at this point. Well, flax oil is very high in omega-3, and if you're taking that and not taking any omega-6s, then you're, you're, uh, I don't think you're handling, the, handling it correctly. Once flax oil is throwing off the ratio between omega-6s and omega-3s. Yeah, I don't, the hemp oil has the balance. It's the only oil I found that has the ratio that uh, uh, Brian Peskin found in his research. If you want to read a good uh, book about this and other things, um, really, only one minute left? Boy. If you want to read a good book, uh, read the, the PEO Solutions by Brian Peskin. 
And he's the one that really helped me understand from his research. And he didn't do the research. He just found this out of the history of research about how we should be using omega-6s and omega-3s. And still today, the medical profession is still promoting higher levels of omega-3s, which is totally wrong. They're still promoting it. But it should be higher omega-6s than omega-3s. It should be anywhere, should be about two and a half to one between omega-6s and omega-3s. And, li pardon? Yeah, right, they do. And, and uh, if you have, you f we found a number of things that have been benefited. Number one is if people have uh, any kind of clogged coronary arteries, taking about 18 weeks of hemp oil can start cleaning that out. It takes about 18 weeks to clean out and open up arteries. Well, it depends on the size of the person. My size, I take two tablespoons a day of it. No, to get together. I take them once in the morning, two tablespoons of hemp oil. Yeah, see, it can be used in cooking, but the, the, the point that's very important is, is that uh, the hemp oil is very critical in so, the omega sixes in ratio to omega three is so critical in many operations of the body. One of the examples that Brian gives in his book is was a doctor who had a dog that had uh, epileptic seizures all the time, and he says he just inadvertently started feeding him the hemp oil, and uh, he says within a less than a week the dog never had any more seizures again. Well, the brain requires a hundred times more omega-6s than any other tissue of the body. And it also is um, a key ingredient in your skin. It's a natural sun blocker in the skin when you take the omega-6s and get them in right ratio. It's oil, this is hemp oil. It's from the seed of the hemp plant, but it's the oil. And it's very nutritious as well. So uh, my wife and I, we both take it with breakfast in the morning, you know, so. Okay, so I guess our time is up. Just about, I will. What do you? If you have any last bits of Okay, questions. any last minute questions here? We got partway through this, but. Uh, now, next, uh, tomorrow, we're gonna talk about the human application, about the numbers, the te urine saliva test numbers and what they represent. So you can, again, appreciate what uh, that represents. Reams had, uh, he was a very uh, unusual genius for what he discovered, but he gave all the credit to God. He said, God gave me this information. He won't give any credit to a university or anything like that. And that's phenomenal because he didn't learn it from a university. Even though he had some degrees, he never gave the institutions any credit for them because he says learning was something that was always ongoing. And so God gave me this information, therefore God wants it out there. So that's what, ha what happened, yes. Right, when you have cationic, yeah. When you're, when you're growing plants, there's, there's two classifications of plants. You have anionic plant growth, that is plants that have leafy stalks that you want to eat the leaves of and the stalk of. Then you have cationic plants, that's where you eat the fruit and the seed of them, all right? If you are growing, and every crop has a unique frequency, and if you're growing uh, two different frequencies on a crop by rotation, in other words, one crop of one frequency, and then you rotate another crop with a different frequency, that means the residue from this crop and the residue from this crop are competing to be available to the next crop coming up. And so if this residue is not the same as the crop that's growing there, then you're shooting yourself in the foot as far as production potential and, and uh, quantity potential and everything like that. Well, that, in a garden, you can't be as strict as I was just talking about because you have a whole bunch of leafy crops here that you want to grow and you can't separate them by, by any means whatsoever. The only thing you can separate is you can separate those that are cationically grown versus those that are anionically grown. 
and then you can benefit from it. But otherwise, all of the leafy crops are going to be grown within an area. We just don't want you to grow the leafy crops with the seed crops and fruit crops. Yeah, no, there's no, there's no recommended distance. You just, we just don't, we just ignore it. Just don't mix them. That's right. Just don't mix them. Keep, keep your region for one separate from the other. Well, that's what it is. It's frequency. Yeah. It's, it's a, and it, and it's, a, yeah, it's all about like attracting like. And so that's why we want to really watch and not grow them in the same region in a garden situation. Okay, how you can get more of this information, as far as I'm concerned, is that you have to go online to our website. And uh, here's, uh, here's our website, just to quickly go through it. And you'll see down here, uh, RBTI video training, and you'll see when you get there, you will see this is the page for RBTI video training, RBTI e-learning, I call it too. And if you go down to advanced ideals, that's right. Okay, here's the soil and garden, soil and garden food training uh, video program, or video training program. Okay, you go to, and you have to, what you have to do is you have to open up an account with digital chalk, and we show you through this page if, with the links. You could do it, go to it, open up an account with Digital Chalk. <clears throat> then you can go in and you'll see when you've done that, you can register for the classes that are available. These are online video uh, training. And we have a garden seminar there in that uh, group. I don't have any other agricultural classes made at this point in time. We have the human where we have four levels. And the last level is a... Um, uh, uh, like an online internship where we ha I set you up with a forum, private forum, where you post cases that you've tested with urine and saliva cases. And then I critique you so that you learn how to evaluate the urine and saliva numbers and end up uh, learning how to utilize the information for tailor making diets for your family or other people if you want to. Anything else? All right, thank you for your attention.